so for context yeah, okay this is like never said this on air before but so, but you guys were all working somewhere else oh yes I so how did you make the decision to quit your job and be like you know what we have an opportunity here. <laughs> so I I, I I I we started um our first order on the platform was on the 1st of January 2020 and if you remember correctly that was when COVID was ravaging the yeah. world but it hadn't really got into Africa at the time especially Nigeria or we're just ignoring it anyways a couple of like I think about two months into starting um, Venice we still had maybe like two users or three users on the platform mm-hmm. Lagos shut down and there were no others on the platform because restaurants shut down too would you, what would your advice be to a fellow Nigerian founder sitting in Lagos or Abuja or Shagamu watching this right now and saying, okay, you want to work on this for raising a family in France, Um, I, I think, first of all, to be honest, like, there's a bit of... What was the biggest learning from Y Combinator for you? Um, so different phases, different things. But now, like, having been through it, um, and this is like a second year out of YC um, I think the biggest learning from or the biggest takeaway from YC is What's up, everybody? My name is Benjamin Fernandez. Welcome back to the Build Our Africa Speaker Series. Today, I'm super excited as we have Tunde Kara, the co-founder and CEO of Vendiz. Vendiz helps restaurants in Africa buy their supplies. Welcome to the show, Tunde. Karibu sana, as they say in Tanzania. Uh-huh. Thanks, man. Hey, man, that 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 Nigerian thanks. So, man, as they say in Nigeria, who's your guy? <laughs> yeah, you're my guy. Yeah, you know, you know, you know how we do it. <laughs> Very cool. Well, welcome to the show. Uh, for those of you who don't know Tunde, Tunde uh, has been building Vendis for the last several years. Uh, they've grown now. They have three hundred over three hundred people on their team. Uh, they service a couple of markets in Africa. We're going to learn about that. We're also going to learn about the challenges that he's faced building the business uh, today in an open conversation. But Tunde. I want to start with something I saw on LinkedIn. You said uh, you you grew up on a farm or you're born on a farm. Tell me more about that. Um, so my parents, they were civil servants. Um, both of them retired now. Um, and at the time, to make ends meet, they used to run several businesses outside of work. Mm-hmm. And one of them was, was farming mm. um, because we had access to large expanse of land um, mm. from the government. And so my, my parents used to do book crop farming. Mm. And then we also used to do um, animal husbandry. Mm. So like we kept all sorts. Like I grew up with, that's why I still love animals. I grew up with all sorts of animals. Chickens, goats, rams. Wow. Um, there was a time we had kept a turtle. All sorts. My yeah. dad even brought home an alligator. Bro. One time. Like, <laughs> my you know, guy, was, was, my guy was, literally had Lacoste yeah, in the he house. Is, he is. <laughs> so the, we used to do that to make ends meet. But even then, I I realized how inefficient it was. Even though that's not how it is stuck in my brain until I got older, because we used to have to give away most of what we 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 grew, and even even with the animals, um, there was a time we had to relocate them and then give a lot of the goats out because mm. they were breeding too fast and we couldn't get somebody to buy them off our hands. So, mm. like, yeah, even then, I started to see some of the problems that I would end up solving about 30 plus years later with Vendis. Wow. wow. So talk to me about the journey of building Vendis from, you know, being in this farm in Nigeria. What city were you guys in? Lagos. In Lagos. Uh, all the way to being a founder of a tech company that was recently backed by Y Combinator, recently raised over $30 million. Tell me about that journey, how you got there. Um, so for context, okay, this is like, never said this on air before, but uh, this is like my fourth business, like official. Um, my first business was when I was about 19, 20, I was in college. Um, it was, it was essentially like an arbitrage market for wristwatches. Um, for, for what? For wristwatches. Okay. So I used to sell wristwatches to my, to my other fellow students. Um, and then after that, when I left school, um, I got a job. And then between jobs, one time I started my own consulting firm, um, media marketing and did that like a side gig for a while. And then how I met my co-founders, I met my co-founders, um, about 
six years ago, six odd years ago, six, seven years ago. Um, and then we started my thought business um, together. Um, that was like in our tech in partnership with Ride Sharing Apps, Uber, Taxify at the time, ETC, but it didn't, it didn't go well. So we it crashed and then we moved on to other things. And then we finally started Vendis. Um, so the journey was like <laughs> maybe about from my first business till, till now, maybe about 15, 15 years thereabouts. Wow. Yeah. 15 years. Yeah. But, but people say Vendi is overnight success, bro. That's what I hear. That's the word on the street. So yeah. what do you respond when people say that you're just an overnight success? <sighs> There's no such thing as an overnight success. Um, like so, so many learnings in those 15 years. Um, and then also working like in corporate for about f- maybe 10, 11 years helped to helped us to grow this business and structure it as quickly as, as we have, because like you take some of those learnings, like, okay, so for, for, for the business that we started the first time, um, all three of us before Wally joined, um, we took learnings from that, how we couldn't fundraise, how like, so th- there are many things you learn from your failures that you put into your quote unquote successes that makes it seem like, Oh, you are an overnight success. That's not true. Like <laughs> it's a, it's, it's years in the making, literally. Like for me, I, I think I caught on to this entrepreneurial bug early, early on when I was a kid. Um, even though I didn't know that was what was happening. My, my, my dad used to run sometimes as much as three, four businesses, <laughs> including a civil service job. So, and he used to involve us as kids. Like you go to, he ran a supermarket with the farm. So like, and he involved us in all of these things. So like, I, I think I caught the bug then. My mom too was the same. Um, she would, she would do her normal job and then come back and make food and all of those things to sell. And like, they were always doing more than one thing, one thing. And when, when I got into the, just before I got into the university, my mom got into this habit. I didn't know why, but she got, she noticed that I liked money and just thinking about money and how to get rich. So she started to get me a lot of business books and self help books. Um, I know a lot of people have issues with self-help books and all that, but like, I think they built the character that I have now, um, business books, like helping me to understand how to start a business, ETC. So yeah, I, I would credit them a lot with, with, with my entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and like you said, like just back to your, your, your question, there's no such thing as an overnight success. Everything is baked in, um, mm. all the years of training, all the, all your experience sort of bring you to this point without you necessarily knowing it. So you talk about your family, uh, you have siblings? Yes, I have three siblings. And your parents still in Lagos? Or? Um, so yeah, both of them in Lagos, they're separated now, but both of them are in Lagos. Okay. So, um, what would your mom say about what you've done today? Um, my mom is still, a bit confused about what I do. Um, for, for context, when I was in secondary school, some of the things that we do now did not even exist. So like you couldn't say I wanted to be, I wanted to lead a marketplace like, or like or a tech business in Lagos. That's like nobody did that. So like every time I try to explain what we do, she just knows that, oh, you do something in tech, blah, blah, blah. And then you guys seem to be popular type of thing. But yeah. She's, she's proud of me. Um, she's very proud of me. Um, but yeah, she doesn't really know what I do. Where are your siblings? Oh, so two of my siblings are here in London. Okay. Um, one is, well, here in the UK, one, one is, in, both of them are Milton Keynes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So you've seen your life change and evolve a lot in the last several years, especially. Uh, you said you've built multiple businesses, quite a few of them had failed. And then, from what I understand, your current startup, you had the same co-founders from a previous startup. Is that correct? Yes. So how did you know you wanted to work with them for your new business? Um, because we're, f- we're friends first, which, which is which is interesting because now that, that we've done this for about three and a half years and then now listening to um, folks at White Combinator, listening to other investors and what they're looking, uh, what they're looking for in your founding team. We sort of just had those ingredients without meaning to. So we're friends. We met. We used to stay in the same housing estate. Um, I used to play games with Olumide, who's my CEO and um, co- CEO and co-founder. Um, Gatsumi, who's the CPO. We also used to play football together. Um, Wale, who en- joined us later as CTO, stayed at the, like in, a, in an estate down the road. Um, they used to, he used to go to church with Gatsumi. Um, so like we all had our lives sort of into, into mind. So we're, we're friends first. And then we get talking, you know, just normal guys talking, working at different jobs. And 
the first um, opportunity we worked on, like the ad tech company came up. Incidentally, me and Olumide were thinking about the same, same kind of idea at almost the same time. And then he comes to me and says, oh, why, why don't we do something? Because I used to work in media tech at the time. I'm like, yeah, I've been thinking about this too. And then we're like, you know what, let's do it. And so we called that to me and then we, 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 we built that together. But it didn't quite kick off. Like I said, there were a lot of issues with kicking off ETC and then we shelved it. That to me went on to be a co-founder at 54 Gene, um, mm-hmm. another YC company. Um, me and Olumide ended up working in the same organization, the same group of companies. Um, I was CEO at um, Red Media. I left Ringe and then he came to join me as COO for Statecraft. So we also had a good working experience working in, in that organization. And then when the Venice thing came up, so how Venice came about was, um, we're all foodies, like till date, like we like to eat, like <laughs> one of the, I just got back from China and like, it was for the World Economy Forum. Um, but like my best experience in China was the food. So, so what, what, what food is? And, and then we started to notice individually, like, um, the food culture and the experience in Lagos eating out was beginning to really decline. Um, like, because I, I was running teams across Africa at the time. Every time you go to a restaurant, come back to Lagos, you would see that either sometimes they would have even shut down or like the service levels would have dropped like remarkably. Yeah. And so one thing led to, to the other and we, because we started business before together, we're used to investing together. Like if you see a business opportunity, like side hustle, we'll do it together. And so Olivier was like, oh, he also had his own experience um, with his wife at a hotel. And then he came to like, you know, let's put some money together. And it's like, there's, there's an opportunity here. Let's, let's see if we can make some money. So we just, we started, there was no vendors at this point. It was just like an offline thing. Like, what are you doing? Um, so what was version zero of Venice? Version zero of Venice was, so Olivier and his wife were at a hotel. Um, and they overheard the, um, manager complaining about supplies. So he apparently had been waiting for supplies for days and he hadn't come. And so Olivier walked up to him, like overhearing his conversation, like, Oh, hey, um, like it looks like you need supplies. And he was like, yeah, like, oh, okay. Um, what are you looking for? Like, oh, if this is my list, if you can, if you can beat it, if you, are you, are you a procurement guy? If you can beat my prices, I'm interested. And just a very price sensitive. And so he comes back to us and say, oh, yeah, there's this opportunity and did a bit of market research and I think we can get better prices. And so we pulled money together, me, um, and then he also approached Katsumi, um, and we put money together to get supplies for, for this hotel. So the first, you were basically your first seed invest in your own business. Oh, yes, definitely. You had to go and find places. I need to pull cash here, borrow money here, there, everywhere, just to try to make this pilot work. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So so bear in mind, we actually weren't thinking about it as a company. We, mm. It was just really a... Side hustle. Side hustle. Let's just yeah. solve this problem. Because I had had my own experience. Um, it was with pork chops. So there used to be this food truck very close to my office. They sell... I think they still sell the best pork chops in the world. Um, and at the time, like during a three week period, just before Lumide approached me about this, this other problem, I, they had, they had gone from seven bad pork chops, um, on one of my visits. Then I went there like about a week later, um, they didn't even have pork chops available. And then by the time I got there about a week later, they shut down. And by the time I tracked the owner down, he was shutting down because he wanted to figure out how to run his business more efficiently because mm. it boiled down to, um, inconsistent, um, procurement practices. Like it couldn't get supplies mm-hmm. on time. It couldn't get, it couldn't, um, 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 vet the quality of the supplies, ETC. So, um, he was shutting down to figure out the supply side of his, his business. So like with that experience, when it comes to me and says, Oh, um, let's put some money together. Like, oh yeah, this actually makes sense because I also experienced this with this person. Mm. And so it was easy for us to pull our money together and try it. But then it wasn't a business. It was a, let's make some money quickly. Yeah. But we quickly figured out there might be something here other than our own experiences when, um, incidentally, Olimide's wife mm. was the one who did the first set of procurements for us. She went to the open markets to, just like farmer's market here, yeah. to buy those supplies. And even at open market prices, we were way cheaper than these hotels um, um, on prices. So we were like, wait, this guy actually has staff. And then he deals with many different um, um, suppliers. If we just walked to an open market and got better prices, there's a serious systemic or structural problem here. And so we decided to delve deeper and ask more questions. And we did that a couple of more times. And now at some point, I'm like, you know what? Actually, we're all tech guys. Why, why don't we actually try and figure this out and see if we can solve this problem at scale? And that's how 
we came up with the so, but you guys were all working somewhere else oh yes I so how that, did yeah. you make the decision to quit your job and be like you know what we have an opportunity uh, here. so I I, I I I haven't investigated this properly but I think there's a bit of a margin in most founders like in mastery because we we all had cushy jobs um Katsumi was a 54 gene at this point um they just raised some money they were the talk of town like oh dynamics company yc company etc so it was, it was he was doing good um me and Olimide, i was ceo at at red media um it's one of the top um biggest PR companies in sub-saharan africa um handled presidential elections etc Olimide was ceo we're earning good money and then we come up with this thing and we're like you know what yeah if we want to really do this because one of the learnings we learned from the first startup was we didn't give it our all because we all had other jobs mm. So that's part of the lessons for like, if we really believe in this thing, then we'll all quit our jobs and, and do it full time. Context. I had just gotten married. Um, Olumide's wife was pregnant. Um, Gatumi was, was the one who was relatively a bit free, but like, oh, of course, quitting 54 gene, like, like, and selling his equity back, all of that was a big deal. Cause this is like one of the most promising YC companies at the time. And so it, it, it took quite a bit for us, but we, we were like, you know what, we believe in this thing. Like it's, it's a, it's more of a passion project for us than an actual business because first of all, we saw the potential of what could happen if we figured it out. And then it was also something that we enjoyed doing. So we're like, you know what, we quit our jobs and we'll face this full time. Um, fun fact, we started, um, our first order on the platform was on the 1st of January, 2020. And if you remember correctly, that was when COVID was ravaging the yeah. world. But it hadn't really gotten to Africa at the time, especially Nigeria. Or we're just ignoring it. Anyways, a couple of, like, I think about two months into starting um, venues, we still had maybe like two users or three users on the platform. Mm -hmm. Lagos shut down. And there were no others on the platform because restaurants shut down too. Wow. So, yeah. And then? It, it, was, it was crazy. It was, <laughs> we had to figure out how to keep others coming in. So, fun fact, we segued into um, COVID supplies at some point mm -hmm. just to keep the lights on. In fact, we also supplied um, diesel mm -hmm. to our estates just to keep the lights on. Um, it was it was it was crazy. Uh, it was it was it was a, it was a crazy period. But what now happened, which we never saw coming, mm -hmm. but now in hindsight, understanding who our users are and who our users' users are, it was always going to happen. So what happened was COVID ended up being, being a, um, a catalyst for us mm. because you, the average African doesn't like to cook yeah. or like the average working class African doesn't like to cook, um, because they, the busy people who work in cities and they would rather eat out because mm. it's more convenient. So they eat either at the office canteen mm. or by some roadside or at a restaurant. So we estimate that about 70% of Africans eat out daily. And so. COVID was not going to change that. People were just going to figure out how to get around that because they started looking for online ways to, to, to like order food. food yeah. And then restaurants too also had to quickly morph and provide online um, avenues to order food. And they actually run out of, run out of their own supplies that they had before the lockdown. And so they remember, remember that was because we had paid so many, like, man, we walked all over Lagos trying to get businesses, but restaurants, almost like medical services are very, they're very archaic. Like they like a system of, mm. a, a way of doing things and they don't want to change. And it's understandable because yeah. they're very peculiar in all of their services. And so when we came to them, you saw some young guys telling, telling them about technology. They're like, please, we have a system that works already. <laughs> we don't care. But now they sort of needed us. They're like, oh, you guys said you could do this thing. Okay, let's try you out. Because now they couldn't go to the markets themselves to buy. But how are you guys doing that if they couldn't? Oh, we had, we had the license to to the logistics license to move around during the time because remember we, we got into COVID supplies at the time because okay, we okay. just wanted to yeah. keep the lights on so we they came to us to say you know what actually can you help us get supplies because we've run out of stock mm. and that is how like we like COVID literally took us like we had like 300% growth in like maybe next like two three months consistently wow so like we went from two or three restaurants to about I think almost a hundred or two hundred in like in like two three months. Wow! So yeah, wow. So so okay. So this is all going on during the pandemic. Yep. And then later in 2020, we met. Yep. So uh, Tunde so and I we, met. We met in 2020. Yeah, 
end late, of 2020 yeah yeah, yeah, yeah correct yeah. so i actually checked the email just now before before the interview we met at the end of 2020 uh, and we met because uh, tunde was applying to y combinator and he was just about to go through his interview process and we did a mock interview together and i remember meeting tunde and i was like okay this is really cool like it's very fascinating what they're trying to build uh and uh, that you know it's been 3 years now of us uh, yeah. us being friends yeah 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 thanks <laughs> Talk, like really like benji was really helpful with, with our mock and also with our first um, um fundraise yeah it was it was, it was cool like why, getting to white combinator was a big deal still is um it was a game changer so when i hear people Anyways, that's another discussion. Yeah, no, but Trash. I actually want to go the next. Yeah. So yeah. tell me about going from doing this pilot, using your own money, and like trying to make things work. You just quit your jobs. Someone's wife is pregnant. Okay, cool. Like you're about to have a baby. You're you just got married, and okay, now we're gonna apply to Y Combinator. Tell me about that. Um, it it was it was in 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 in, ter- in terms of actual length of. Length of time it was short because it was all of this happened within one year, mm-hmm. but in in terms of of experiences it was it was long, I uh, like it, it that one year felt like twenty because <laughs> like literally you go from a high end to earning almost nothing, um but a, a couple of things helped us um first before we kicked off fully um we raised a family and friends round like literally this was a family and friends round. Because it was our uncles, um, so we went to them. You know, we we done a pilot before this, mm-hmm. um, so we went to them and said, you know what, this is what we're thinking about, and this is what we want to do, and they believed us and give us um, some money. So we raised about maybe like a hundred k, hundred and twenty k thereabouts um, from from them. Um, but because of the nature of what we do, that quickly went. Like by yeah. the time we scaled to. Um, a couple 10 businesses like it was it was gone because first of all the banks refused to finance you your working capital because at this point we were financing all the transactions on the platform right. so they refused to fight because you don't have a track record they don't they don't understand the food industry so they don't extend them loans so we had to prove the business model so in fact we just started getting finance proper finance from banks maybe like towards the end of our second year wow because we now we proved the business model we now understood the credit history of our users but, but, but just even there i think there's a lesson there like i think what's really fascinating is the fact that you guys were even willing to open a friends and family round see the challenge i think many founders that i meet at least across the continent everybody's really nervous like benji what if i lose all the money benji what if you know i go and ask my uncle or auntie or whoever for you know $5000 $10000 etc and i lose it all what happens right how did you in lagos nigeria get over that hurdle mentally so like i said founders have a bit of a crazy streak like i'm sure there's a gene somewhere somebody needs to study because one of the things that you need to be successful in this field is probably an overconfidence of sorts mm. where you really believe in yourself and you really believe that you're the shit like and then you believe that man this thing I'm doing has like is absolutely going to work there's no other no other way around this so i i think that helped also helped because we had put our money into this like we had committed like a good chunk of our finances and we still even after the, like i said money went very quickly mm. even after that we still put some of our money because we believe this was going to work and we saw mm. we saw the opportunity even right. though we knew it was hard work um so that's how we got over that because we like we had backed ourselves right and then we went to people who sort of trusted us and also like they saw our track record they knew us from way before and they were willing to also back us because i remember one of them told us and said like god bless him um uncle ni he's like um even if this thing doesn't work it won't be because you guys didn't try your best so i don't have any qualms about giving you my money so like like that's that's that's, that's some serious belief the other the other one um, uncle baro was like you know what you guys are basically pushing me a paper company like <laughs> nothing nothing is really in existence but hey i'll give you my let's let's see how this goes so like essentially they were backing us as founders and because we believed in ourselves we we it was easy for us to accept the belief of other people mm. yeah so Would you what would your advice be to a fellow Nigerian founder sitting in Lagos or Abuja or Shagamu watching this right now and saying okay you want to work on this for raising a family in friends round Um I I think first of all to be honest like 
there's a bit of privilege with raising a family and friends around that we have to admit. Um, yeah, like not everybody's family and friends can help you raise like a hundred k plus, especially in this climate. But like my advice to it, so, so I say that for context, but I also don't want to discourage anybody from trying what they like doing what they really set want to do. Because like the thing that got us to even raising that round was starting from where we were. Like it was really just a, okay, there's, we found this gap in the market and then we experimented with it. It wasn't a lot of money at the time. And then we started there and proved something would work. And then because we saw that something, we did our research and so it was huge. And then we could take that confidence and a bit of traction and say, okay, you know what? We want to build this out into like a proper platform. Can you get us some money? Um, how do I put it? For you to raise a family and friends around, first of all, you need to build a track record of some sort. So it's like you said with the earlier question about um, this, like you guys are an overnight success. Before we started Venice, we all had sort of successful careers. Not everybody's going to follow that path, but because we built some sort of track record, mm-hmm. like me at Red Media and Ringe, Olumide, same thing, Gatsumi, same thing. Mm-hmm. It was also easier for these guys to trust us with their money, even though they're family and friends. Yeah. Um, so building a track record, building your network. Yeah. So when you get into your career as a young guy, yeah. um, be very conscious about building your network because yeah. you never know who's going to link you to who. It might not be a f- direct family, but who link it to who that can give you your first seat check. Mm. So building that reputation mm. by doing awesome work not good work mm-hmm. like take your job so seriously people people think that when you work for other people um it's another person's business so i shouldn't give my all that's that's such a fallacy because the amount of 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 energy you put into another man's business is exactly the same amount of energy you get back from it because you, guess what you're learning a whole lot mm-hmm. so building that track record and reputation ultimately helps you when you start your own thing so yeah network like crazy mm-hmm. and try and build an awesome career not a good career mm-hmm. an awesome career so before you got to y combinator gatumi had joined the company yes okay so tell me about that how did that happen because gatumi was uh, co-founder of 54 Gene, and basically he left 54 Gene to join you guys. How did you even have that discussion with him? So, like, just a, a bit of correction. Like, Gatsumi started it from scratch with okay. us. Okay, with you guys. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. So, so he, so when we got the idea, yeah, um, he quits that he quits um okay. for Jim to start this with us so we got into white Combinator together while it was already on board at this time um because we wanted somebody who was a technical co-founder who like we all had ideas of how to run tech etc but we wanted somebody because we knew this was huge so we wanted to go all in so we wanted somebody who was pretty good at building technology from the ground up and at the time while he was an ibm consultant um working with ai etc which is very interesting with all the ai buzz now um, and then he had built like um, um, some apps for MTN who wants to be a millionaire. Um, I think they had like over 500k downloads in the space of a couple of weeks. Yeah. It's, so like he knew how to build technology from the ground up. So we wanted somebody like that on the team. And um, we were fortunate that somebody like that was in our circle and he was already a friend. So did you know the 54 Gene team? Yeah, yeah, I did. So how did your relationship change with the team when... Your co-founder left Fifty Four Gene to join you to build Vendis. Oh, it, it was it was so we're, we're all friends. Well, so I met I met Abasi um, through, and then the other guys um, who who also found, co-founded in the beginning through Gatsumi um, because we we're already friends before he started Fifty Four Gene with them. Um, and then when he it was it was like an amicable thing. Um, like Abasi was 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 all good about it. They had an agreement, and yeah. He left and then came to focus on this. So it wasn't, there was no animosity type thing. It was, it was a clean cut thing. Cool. Talk to me about Y Combinator. Uh, you applied three times to Y Combinator. And I believe, was it the fourth time you got in or the third time? No, the third time. The third time you got in. Yeah. So applying to Y Combinator is a lot of work, right? You have to go through this process, so many questions, and it really gets you to think about your business. Oh, yeah. And that's when we met, when you were applying for Y Combinator. Yeah. And... Talk to me about the journey of getting into Y Combinator. Um, so like, like you already mentioned, we, we applied three times before we got in, because the, the third time. Um, it was it was a very interesting process. Like it was a life-changing process, quote unquote. Um, because like you said earlier, what we realized every time we applied was 
it got you to think about your business. Um, and it also got you to think about your business from an empirical point of view. Like you were looking at numbers, you were looking at stats, you were looking at different things because that's how the questions come. And it helped you to think about the viability of your business. And so every time we went through that process, even when we didn't get in, we had a better business afterwards. Mm. So it helped us to put structures in place, helped us to think about things differently. So we liked going through that process, even though we failed twice before we, we were successful the third time. Um, fun fact, like I knew about Y Combinator. I didn't know about Y Combinator until um, around the time that 54 Gene got in. Because mm. like I said, Gatim was my friend and then he was like, oh, we're applying to this thing called Y Combinator, blah, blah, blah. That's, that's the, I think that was the first time I, I really paid attention to them. I'd heard about them, but mm -hmm. it wasn't really a thing for me. It was like outside of my, my worldview. And then when um, Gatim was applying and oh, they're like, oh, they're going to Mountain View for the interview. So that's when I started to pay attention to, to Y Combinator. So that's, that's a very interesting thing because um, about two years later, we were, we got in. So yeah, YC was a, like a foreign thing. And so when, when we, when, when we were going to start Vendies, again, like I said, founders really have this <laughs> incredible self belief. Like it's, it's almost a madness because we took for granted, literally, this is a crazy thing mm. that I don't advise anybody watching. <laughs> we took for granted that we we're going to get into YC. Like I don't know why we had like we just believe that oh because okay so Gatim is 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 a y, YC um, founder um, etc and then we're building this great thing so there's no way we so we even pitched to our, our, our family and friends that oh they need to invest in us because we're going to get into YC like it was almost as, as if um, Michael Sibyl had promised us a place <laughs> <laughs> but far from it like first time we 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 applied. We didn't even get the, a, a response back in terms of like, oh, wow. you know, like we didn't get into the interview. Second time we applied, we didn't get into the interview. Um, it was the third time we applied that we got into the interview. Wow. Like it was, it was, it was far from being a show in. Like in fact, like, like, you know, thousands of people, like yeah. from Africa alone, I think at least like 20,000 or 30,000 applications. Wow. So it was, it was, it was a journey for us. But to, to your question, like it was life changing because it helped us at the different different applications helped us to grow our business better because mm. with every new application we we're a better business we had better metrics um we were obviously growing um and then the final one we applied again because we're like first of all we got the um prompt from yc because we weren't, weren't going to apply because at this point we're getting a bit jaded and we're like you know what we're just going to go and raise our seed around ourselves etc and but yc sent us a a message i don't know if they sent it to everybody but they sent it to us and said you know what you guys were in the top 10 percent of the last application um and if your metrics have improved significantly since then you stand a good chance of entering now so why haven't you guys applied basically and this was like i think this was like a week to deadline um so we we got it we're a bit cheerful but like you know what like it's so one of the things that people don't realize about i segue a bit I realize about being a founder is you get so many no's oh my god it does a number on your <laughs> ego so like at this point we're, we're kind of jaded because we have also applied to another um um accelerator global village mm -hmm. village global sorry yeah. village global at the time and i got into the final stage after like a couple of months and they turned us down at the final stage because of some so-called african expats um and so, like, we're just gotten off of that. I think it was like the same week that YC now sent us this reminder email about applying. And so we're a bit jaded. We're like, you know, all these accelerators, they don't, they don't, they don't value us. So, you know what? Let's just figure this thing out and just go and raise our seed ourselves, etc. Mm -hmm. Um, because at the time mm -hmm. we looked at YC as just, you know, let's go and raise our seed. Like, YC will help us raise the seed. Mm -hmm. And now that we're in YC, we've gotten a whole lot more than raising funds. Anyway, mm -hmm. back to, 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 mm -hmm. to the, to the question. Mm -hmm. Um, so we got that and then we're like, you know what, a couple of days to, to the deadline, mm -hmm. we were like, you know, what? let's, let's just apply. It won't take us anything. So we did a rush application. That was the crappiest, application I, don't use, of all I, I don't want to use the, the French word, <laughs> the crappiest application of all the three applications, because usually it take, it will take us weeks of preparation yeah. to, 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 cause we're thinking through the numbers we're doing, like we're changing the words when, you know, you have to submit a YC video we usually would do like multiple takes and then yeah. edit. Like it was a whole process. <laughs> this one, a couple of days to the time, we answered the questions, did everything. Like it was very short answers straight to the point. No, we didn't think about it. And then the day we submitted, I think that was the deadline night. Yeah. 
we just suddenly remember, oh, we haven't done the video. So we're leaving the office at 8 p.m. that day. And I'm like, oh, guys, we haven't actually done our YC video. So we just sat down, gave one of our employees uh, one of camera. our phones. Yeah. And then we did one take. Like, in fact, because part of the criteria is you mentioned the name of the company. Yeah. It's, we, didn't, we forgot to mention the name of the company. So I'm like, oh, guys, we actually didn't mention the name of our company. My guys were like, you know what? Yeah, if it's it doesn't enough. work, it doesn't work. <laughs> it's good enough. So it was the crappiest of all our applications. And that's what finally got us to... To the interview, so yeah, it was it was it was a very interesting process. Um, yeah, getting into YC it was, it was it was. What was the biggest learning from Y Combinator for you? Um, so different phases, different things. But now, like having been through it, um, and this is like a second year out of YC. Um, I think the biggest learning from or the biggest takeaway from YC is the community. We're sitting here because we met YC founders. Um, the community is awesome. Like you literally have people who don't owe you anything, who go out of their way to help you figure out stuff. That's one. Then two, it's the, what's the word now? Um, it's the methodology behind how YC guides its companies. So I like to, I like to use the word guide because you and me both know that yeah. you have, you have um, partners at YC who will never tell you what to do. Yeah. Like, even when you ask them point blank and say, you know what, um, I have, I, I need to choose between A and B. What do you think? Should I choose A or B? They'll just give you... <laughs> they ask you questions. Exactly. They ask you <laughs> questions that help you... Answer. Answer that. So, like, but they, they do it in such a way from empirical data because they've seen hundreds of companies. Yeah. So they, they, they know to a very certain degree... Yeah what might work and what might not. Yeah. And then they give you all of that data and it helps you a whole lot. That's why um, when you're in the room with a YC founder, you sort of know, especially somebody who really went through the process, you sort of know. Like I've had investors come to meetings and say like, yeah, you YC founders are this certain type of way. Because it's true. Like for instance, like YC founders are the ones who end meetings with investors and say, you know what? Like, yeah, I don't think this is a, <laughs> this is <a> fit. <laughs> because you sort of kind of know when the discussions are happening that yeah we we don't want this guy on our cap table no or this is not going even if this guy comes on our cap table yeah. it's not going to work so like why is it gives you that kind of yeah um 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 confidence because you you have access to empirical data that shows you yeah. this might work and this might not work and i think that's the, my biggest take from it like yeah. stuff like if so now that we're we're on this side Sometimes I see the invest, um, like I like angel investments in pre-seed. Yo, and you heard that? That's a plug. Sometimes you see the invest. So if you guys are looking for cash, homeboy, hit up Tunde uh, uh, for that for that check. Uh, anyway, so like sometimes I, I angel invest, and and it helps. Yeah. To know what to look for. Yeah. Sometimes it's it almost looks like stereotyping, but it's not because you you, you for instance you know yeah. it's easier to to um to what's the word now be successful at a startup if you have co-founders mm, yeah it's not impossible to do it as a solo founder but yeah. it makes it even tougher to do that's one you also know that one of the biggest um um, um points of failures for for startups is founder friction mm. so you t you tend to want to back founders who are friends or who've had some sort of working relationship, etc. So, like that kind of empirical data, and there are many of those. Like when you, when you keep going back into the community, you have a a treasure trove of of of, of material in YC that you can always go back to. Your partners are always available to you. Like that's going back once in a while to replenish the fountain, so to speak, is one of the biggest biggest advantages of YC. Yeah. Talk to me about so from Y Combinator, you raised three point two million dollars. Yep. And then you went to build, and almost a year ish later, you raised thirty million dollars. Yep. How back to back fundraisers? Tell me about that journey. Man, yeah, fundraising is <laughs> it's it's a, it's a fun part of my job, and it's also one of the least um, most annoying part of my job. Like it's it's extremely tasking. Most most people don't realize how 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 emotionally draining fundraising is. But yeah, um, to, to answer your question, um. We did that because we're growing fast. Like we, we saw, we saw the potential of what we, we, we did in just in less than a year. And we're like, you know what? No one is really doing exactly what we're doing. Um, no one is providing this value that we're providing in the market. Um, why don't we scale as fast as we can? 
And at that point, we already also had investors who were who were looking to get in if there was an opening. So we're like, you know what? Let's just open open a new round because if we raise X amount, it'll be easier for us to grow to this level, like capture more of the market um, and improve the model even more. So so that's why we, we raised so quickly. And the reason we were successful raising um, within a year, even in like one of the worst markets in the last decade was because we we're also growing very fast. Like I said, like we, like our metrics were like, we, at some point we we're growing 40% <laughs> month on month. Um, so it was, it was crazy. Just for context, we grew almost 2000 X in one year. Mm-hmm. So like it was, it was, it was fast growth. And, and that's, that's what sort of, I'm mean, like, you know what, for us to keep growing exponentially and Covering and seven for us, it wasn't really a conquer the market strategy. Mm -hmm. It was more of a solve more problems for more businesses Mm -hmm. strategy. Because, like I said, it's it's a passion point for us what we do, and we had testimonials on the platform even till now of businesses who join our platform, and because of the services we provide for them and the um, burdens we take off their backs, they can now grow their businesses more than the one location they were at. Some grow one, two, three other locations on the platform um, from where they started on the platform. Um, Like one random guy hit me up on Twitter once and like, oh, when we moved into Abuja, that's one of the cities that we're in in Lagos. Like we've changed his business, he's gotten new locations, he has more staff now. So we wanted to be able to provide that sort of story for as many businesses across Africa as possible. And that's what we're still doing. What's the traction like now? Um... I'm not sure my board of directors want me to talk about no, exact like, numbers, yeah, but, but but more like okay, you know, your company's grown. But oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So so um, when we go into YC, we're just in Lagos. Yeah. Um, by the end of the year, we've gotten into three other cities: okay. um, Abuja, Ibadan. Um, so we're in three cities by by at the time we raised. Now, um, a year later, we are in two countries. So we're operational across the whole of Nigeria, um, and also in Ghana. Um, also looking to expand into one more um, African country, possibly for the end of the year. With expanding a business from 10 people to 300 people over a year and a half, there's obviously scaling challenges. What were some of the difficult issues that you guys face when scaling the business? Structure. A structure breaks every <laughs> every two months mm. because you're growing really fast. Um, but like you said, back to the point on... on on um, overnight success. We had each learned how to build structure with other businesses. Um, so starting Vendies, there are lots of things that we put in place from the beginning that helped us to grow structurally. Even as more weight came on top of the organization, it was easy for us to tweak and keep growing. So that helped a lot. But the biggest challenge with growing very fast in sh- such a short period is u- usually has to do with people. Because we grew from 10 people to, to almost 300 people now. And so at, at 10 people, like, I knew everybody's problems. Like, I knew who was getting married. I knew who was sick. I knew. And then all of a sudden, I wake up, like, less than two years later. And we have 300 people. And then I'm walking into the office. And some guys greet me. And I don't know this face. Like, because, <laughs> because, <laughs> like, I'm literally seeing you for the first time. Yeah. Um, so like it's 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 a shock for you, yeah. And what that means, implications of, of what that means in terms of workflow and etc. Is if you're not careful, you become very bureaucratic. You lose that mm. um, that gumption, that 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 spice of speed that you used to have. Because mm. now the different layers of 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 communications, like the different layers of decision making, mm. that need to happen for certain things to be done, and so because we want to maintain that same startup speed flow that we have, you have to figure out how to tweak your structure in a way where you don't have bottlenecks mm. waiting for decisions to be made and then your company starts to die slow there. So the biggest issue we're dealing with a fast growth company is figuring out people on structure and then communication gaps. Mm. Have you felt betrayed during that process? <sighs> yes. Um, betrayed is a strong word, but yes, like you, you feel some type of way when you start with a couple of guys. So, so it was us four co-founders first doing our thing. And then we started to bring in employees as we could afford to pay them. 
And then, as a founder, because, like, hey, I, I like to believe that humans are fundamentally good. We're not, we're not perfect, we're fundamentally yeah. good. So, most founders I know, they're, of course, they're exceptions to the case, are very, like, have a lot of goodwill, especially for their early stage employees. And you're like, you know, let's build this together. Like, we're not selling you a pipe dream. Like, we believe when we say, let's build this together. And then, as it starts to grow, you see people who don't believe anymore and then they leave for other stuff or they get a better offer and then they leave. It sort of breaks your heart because you're like, oh my God, like, first of all, you might take it personal because you're like, oh, this person doesn't believe in me anymore and is moving to, some, to do something else. Or you might feel like betrayed, especially if they're moving into a business that can be potentially competitive. a competitor. So yeah, sometimes you feel quote and unquote. That's why I said betrayed is the big yeah. one because at the end of the day, everybody needs to make their decisions. Now, after doing this for like three and almost three years plus, um, I'm less jaded. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad mm-hmm. thing, or but I, I think I just looked at the data and realized, you know what? People leave sometimes. We still have some of some many of the early stage guys who are with us, but some of those guys have left. So yeah, it, I'm it, sure there's a, a lot of lessons you've learned in the journey. Oh yeah. What would you say are like the top two or top three that like you know what? If I wrapped up the three in like a summary, these would be the top three lessons I've learned while building Bendis. Hmm. Top three lessons. Document, document, document. Um, I say this because it kind of applies to almost everything. Um, so a lot of businesses, it's really in Africa, and this is why you have you you don't really have a traction of businesses who are multi generational, because as a culture, we're not the greatest as documenting. So we don't document our successes. We don't document our, 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 our failures, etc. It's, there's no proper process to it. So with Vendis, one of the things again that we learned from, from our other past business and failures is we learn to document what works, what doesn't work. And so when we come to similar scenarios, we're not trying to guess. We know exactly what works and what based off of what we've documented and then we improve on that. So documentation helps you to improve your processes, helps you to improve a lot of things around the, the organization. Like, so th- that's, that's to be honest, that's our biggest game changer. Like it's, it's even for the smallest stuff, like I'm traveling, for instance, I have a travel SOP mm-hmm. that my EA follows because she knows that, okay, when Tina is traveling, these and these and these are the things that I need to take care of. So that every time I travel is a seamless process. And then if we notice a hiccup on one of those travels, we put that in the SOP and say, okay, on the next trip, we need to look out for... So that, that's... that's. If I'm going to say, like, one thing that has, has stood yeah. us out, yeah, it's, it's documented. Yeah. Um, um, maybe maybe another thing is um, believe in yourself. But I think every every guy who decides to start a startup probably has that already in spades. Mm. Because you you can't do this without like an obnoxious belief in yourself. Like sometimes it's, it's, it's borderline. Mm-hmm. Um, um, what's the word now? Like you, it's almost freaky how, how much you need to believe in yourself because if you don't, nobody else will. Mm-hmm. So you were just getting married before starting the business. Yeah. And tell me about the phone conversation you had to have with your wife about quitting your full-time job to start Vendee's. <laughs> yeah, it was it was not the easiest conversation because how she told it like about a year later because she didn't say anything to me because I couldn't tell she didn't want to upset my equilibrium. Um, but how she told me a year later was like, oh, I just basically made a decision and decided to plunge the whole family into <laughs> into uncertainty because in my mind I, I was like, oh, like I so she knew about the side gig and everything, but. Like she didn't understand how passionate about I was about it, and that I was going to want to do this full time and quit my my other job. So that that conversation, in hindsight, wasn't difficult on my part, part, but it was difficult for her. And like I said, she didn't tell me this until like almost a, about a year later. I was going to YC because she she knew that like she didn't want to upset my equilibrium and make me worry about her. So yeah, she she just took it like a champ. Um, and then apparently she, so, so it was, we had that conversation. She was driving back from work in Lagos, traffic, everything. And I get on the phone and I'm like, oh yeah, by the way, um, 
So um, I'm quitting my job as CEO at Red Media, and then we're going to do this full time. Me and Olu Media and Katumi ETC. And then, according to her, this like I said, she told me after we're going to YC, and this was like a year later. She got off the call after we we're done, and then she packed somewhere and had a good cry. Because here's the just think about it, like she's she's getting married, um, she's planned her life a certain way, um, there's certain comforts that she's used to. And then here's this dude <laughs> who comes up with a brainwave because I, like in my head now, not like I have, it's, it's one of the flaws that I've had to work on. Um, because like sometimes I'm having communications with myself. Like I live in my head a lot. And so I, I'm thinking I'm telling you stuff that I'm not telling you all. Like I think I'm communicating in a way that I am not. And so that, that was one of the situations. And, and she's, she's like, she's just hearing this thing out of the blue. Like I'm, I'm, going to quit my job to do this full time like how where what's the money going to come from so she packed had a good cry didn't tell me anything about it and then she did one of the my, my wife is a bit she's very practical and she's she's a bit crazy sometimes and then she she said she drove herself to the pharmacy and went to buy contraceptives because she's like <laughs> <laughs> no kids no kids <laughs> until we figure this this thing out like there's no way i'm having kids with all of this tumor so like it was was it funny um, in hindsight, it was funny, um, but like it was a decision that she had to make, and and, and I, I think I'm glad she she did because, like, imagine bringing a kid into all of that uncertainty would have been even doubly hard. Like, and my experience was shared amongst my other co-founders too because at the time, Olumide's wife was also pregnant, about to have a kid. Um, she actually had a kid during the pandemic when we were locked down and shut down, and so it was like. It was, it was, it was crazy. It was, it was, it was tough. How do you deal with the emotional stress of running a business? <clears throat> I, I think one of the biggest challenges of, of running a business, especially fast growth startup, is this side, like, like managing your emotions, managing your mental, your mental health. Like I know mental health is all a vibe and, and buzz now, but it's really important for founders because that's one of the first things that you neglect or you don't pay attention to. And that's the one thing that can actually bring you down as a founder and affect your company. Um, because a lot of what you see on the outside as your company's growth, as, as what you're building, like the physical manifestations of your company comes from you, comes from within you. So if you're not okay within you, then the feel that gives life to the things that are manifesting physically ceases to exist and so everything goes downhill. So every founder needs to to really prioritize their mental health and how how their emotions because everything is emotional for a founder. Like many of us don't like to talk about it, but it is like fundraising is emotional, like getting 99% no's and hoping you get that 1% yes that will take you to the next phase is very stressful for, for context. When we're raising our Series A, you will think that, oh, because we had already done, like Sid, and it was pretty successful, you think that, oh, like there was some experience that would make it easier to raise the Series A. That's not true. Mm-hmm. Like, if anything, it was even tougher because also life doesn't stop for you. Like, life keeps happening. Yeah. So at that time, we had moved countries. Um, my wife was pregnant. In fact, she, she gave birth to her son in the middle of the fundraise. So here I am, shuttling to, to three countries, because at, at some point, Ghana came into the mix, shuttling different countries every other week, um, trying to raise our, our seed round. Um, when a new country, without all the... Um, social nets that we had when we were in, in Lagos. Um, like, in Lagos, we had, like, a battalion of nannies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but in, in the UK, like, you, you had to deal with certain things yourself. So, like, all of that pressure. So, like, I, like I'm a founder and CEO uh, in the morning. I'm doing dishes and trying to help my wife get to her, her appointments. during the, Like, it was, it, was, it was a madness. And, and, and I had to step back at some point and just, like, find myself mm-hmm. because... If I didn't, like, everything was going to go to, 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 to blaze it. So, yeah, like, yeah. dealing with your emotional health um, is, is very important for you as a founder. So, like, for, for me, what I do is, even now, when it starts to get overwhelming, you need to, like, 
you need to find your happy place. And a happy place might be an activity, it might be hanging out with your loved ones. It is, you need to find that one thing or those things that you do that remind you of who you are before any of this founder thing, or any of this startup thing came up. Like, what do you like to do? Like, so what is that for you? Um, I play games. Um, I like I I play FIFA, FIFA? a lot. Okay. FIFA, um, other games too, but nice. mostly FIFA. I play chess. Um, sometimes I just like to just go somewhere serene. Um, it's also why I picked where we live right now mm. because like I like to be around nature, I eat to see, so it helps me to calm down. Sometimes I travel, mm-hmm. like sometimes I go out with my wife, like we just go and have dinners. Like so, mm-hmm. you find those small right. Quote and unquote inconsequential things that you can throw yourself into. Yeah. That takes you away from all of mm. the madness for a bit and helps you to get yourself back. Right. Your wife seems like she's been instrumental in your journey, uh, especially being a founder. Oh yeah, definitely. If she was in this room right now, what would you tell her? She's 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 my hero. She's like like after the foundation that my parents gave me, like she's for Vendis to be successful, she's been a huge part of that. Like in the early days, she even went as far as lending us money to handle working capital ETC from how, like, bear in mind, like I said, she, like, she was upset at the whole quitting my job thing and didn't tell me anything about it until there was some sort of stability and she could tell that story. So she, cause she didn't want to upset my equilibrium. Mm-hmm. So imagine your wife who's, who's like wondering how all of this is going to settle. Yeah. But still believing you in you enough to, to give you her, part of her own funds to make sure it works. Like, mm-hmm. so we're, like we're pulling funds from our savings, pulling, f- like just trying to make this thing stabilize and get it to work because we're growing. And then we need that working capital to fund a couple of things. So mm-hmm. we'll just, like, we'll take loans from our own savings. At some point wow. we took loans from her, from her own savings. So like, she's been extremely supportive. So yeah, um, if, if she was in this room right now, I'm like, yeah, there's no way I would have done this without you. What's next for Vendiz? Help more food businesses grow. Like that's that's really it. Um, so yes, I know everybody, founders especially, can get lost in all of this. Oh, let's grow, let's capture more markets. For us, it really is helping these businesses grow. Like so, for Vendiz, we want to be able to provide um, hope and and um, a different path for as many food businesses as possible because we see the data and it shows that when you're on the Vendis platform as a food business, you have access to many things that you would not have access to if you were not on the platform. Like you have access to reliable supply um, that you can track the quality, you can track the timing. Right now, if you place your order on Vendis, you can get it in less than 12 hours. Mm-hmm. Um, you have access to financing on the platform through our banking partners. Um, so all of these things helps to take a huge burden mm-hmm. that comes with running a food business from you and then you can focus on growing your stuff, especially if you're good at, at your business. So yes, providing the solutions for more and more companies is is, is what's next for, for Vendis. So you've been around uh, and you say you're a foodie. Uh, yeah. So apart from Nigeria, which African country has the best food? <laughs> I haven't eaten Tanzanian food, so I'm not going to say Tanzania. I mean, yeah, you didn't have to say Tanzania. It's fine. It's cool. Like he's not been there yet. That's why he, he would have said Tanzania if he, he had been there, but clearly he's not been there yet. But it's cool. Well, it's like, Hmm. African cuisine, I like. I, I heard you're about to say Ghana and Jollof, right? Yeah, so, so they're like, I guess maybe because they're, they're pretty close to our culture, mm. so maybe Ghanaian. I, yeah, Ghanaian. Yeah. So you believe Ghana and Jollof is better than Nigerian? Of course jollof? not. I mean, that's what you kind of just said. No, no, no. So after Nigerian cuisine, yes. I, I mean, I can. I can yeah, my, our Ghanaian brothers, they try. They try. They try. <laughs> like, a lot of it is like pretend Nigerian food but, mm. but they, they they know how to pretend well like with the jollof and all that yeah. so if you were to sit down for dinner with one founder you admire the most in the world who would it be? hmm who would it be? there are many on this list but most likely Jeff Bezos why? because he's Business trajectory is kind of similar to us. Build a marketplace first and then build other businesses on top of it. So similar to what we're doing, like we built the marketplace first and then we're building 
other um, SaaS and other things, payments, etc. on top of on top of our marketplace. Um, and then also, like I, I've read a lot of his history, read a lot of what he's done, and the audacity to believe some of the things he believed at the time when no, when no one else saw the markets. It's kind of similar to to how we think about and, and what we see with Venice because. Mm-hmm. A lot of people see attraction now and see what we've done, and they're owing and eyeing. Yeah, but nobody believed this was possible just yeah. three years ago. In fact, we had investors who would come on the pitch and say, "I had one ridiculous investor who said, oh, that he's walked into several restaurants in Ikoi, and they're never full. So where's the market? So like we 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 like." Bear in mind when 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 we started this, the rave was fintechs, and to a very large extent, it still is fintechs. Mm-hmm. And so people, so it's opportunity cost. Do I put my money in mm. a full tech business, or do I put it in a fintech mm-hmm. who might bring back my multiples? Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like when when the, mm-hmm. when the thing like where where no, where mm-hmm. where like nobody knew us, mm-hmm. and then talking about growing a marketplace for food businesses, like like what what are you guys thinking? Where's the market here? So yeah, so, so why why I like the Bezos story is like from way back when I'm watching some of his interviews and he's talking about the fact that Amazon is going to have a billion dollar market cap. Mm-hmm. At that point, there was no single billion dollar company in the world. Mm-hmm. So like this guy saw the potential of what was possible mm-hmm. and he called it, even though nobody believed in him. I, I, I read um, the Everything Store. And there was this meeting they apparently had with his... So Amazon has started growing at this point. And then with his um, with the, his managerial team at the time. Mm-hmm. And then they were sort of setting like crazy goals about where they'll be in the next, I think, 10 years or so. And the amusing thing, or in the next 20 years, I think, I can't remember. And the amusing thing was nobody even came close yeah. to where they are right now. So like, it just gives us hope that some of the things that we think about right now... Mm-hmm in our heads and some, some of the things written in paper that, about our possibilities will actually come through like true because where we're coming from <clears throat> nobody saw us getting here and we're just barely scratching the surface so yeah Bezos is one of the people like I, I like to I like to hear how he thinks about stuff like how how he's he's built different businesses mm-hmm. that are almost non-related like he's building his, his spaceship company um, it, it, yeah it's, it's like For sure Different, different businesses, so yeah. Cool. Quick fire round. Um, you said you like sports. Yep. Ronaldo or Messi? <laughs> How's this even a comparison? Messi, of course. Oh, wow. I don't know if we can be friends. I'm going to just end the show right here. <laughs> like, my guy said, my guy said, me- yo. <laughs> well, 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 um, 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 disclaimer, I mean, Barca fan, so. Okay. That's- like, but, but really, Messi, like, how? Like, bro. Bro. The dude has won every bro. single possible. He was thing. handed the World Cup. You know that too. It's, how do you hand somebody World Cup, bro? You literally. How many penalties are you gonna give them, bro? How many penalty for Argentina? <laughs> Yo, we're gonna fight after this <laughs> episode. This conversation does not end here. No, nah, that's a bit of a no slander, isn't it? It's, Ronaldo tries. He's yeah. he's done well for himself. But mm. yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, other quick fire: Nike or Adidas? Hmm. For style, Adidas. Adidas. Yeah. Okay. For style. Um, favorite music, Afri- African music artist. I rarely have favorites of anything. I have a couple of like favorite Asha. Right now. Asha. I don't okay. know if you know her. Um, I like Bonner. I can be an ass sometimes, but I like him. <laughs> um, I like Simi. Simi. Yeah. Nice. Um. Favorite African athlete. Favorite African athlete of all time. Of or... all time. Hmm. That's a close one between Kanu Wanko and JJ Okocha. I think JJ Okocha. JJ Okocha. Yeah. Over the Didier Drogba. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> of course yes. This guy seems upset. <laughs> Bro. Course, Nigerians yes. always support Nigerians. If you don't know, now you know. <laughs> What's the new saying? Is it Idan Gun Gun? Yeah, Idan. Idan. Idan Gun Gun. Yeah. Okay. What's that mean? So it, it just means like someone who's so good at whatever they're doing, like he's almost paranormal, like supernatural. Like it's like that's the Idan, like this guy, whatever he's doing, he's the absolute best at. 
It like it's it's miraculous. Am so I saying it properly? It don't ganga. It don't ganga. It don't yeah. ganga. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Cool. Well, Tunde, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure hosting you on the show today. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your inspiring journey from where you guys started off building from zero to 300 people at the company to raising 30, over $30 million. And now as you guys expand to multiple markets off across the African continent, we wish you all the best. I'm really proud of you and the journey that you've been on. Crazy thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. And uh, he said that he's going to come to Tanzania. So um, all of you guys heard that here first. Um, he might be moving to Tanzania. Too. He might be japaing to Tanzania. Uh, but yeah, ladies and gentlemen, this is a wrap for Build Africa Speaker Series today. Um, we have a couple of other exciting speakers coming up over the next several weeks. Stay tuned and don't forget to, I think I've got to say this because it's on YouTube, like and subscribe to the channel or follow us on Spotify, Pod, Apple, Pod, yeah, you know what? I shouldn't have been a TV presenter at all. But anyway, take care, everybody. See you, and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.